Hello, everyone. Welcome to the podcast from Nova Southeastern University's Geriatric Workforce Education Program. This podcast is made to encourage, enhance, and promote all those amazing health professionals working with people with Alzheimer's disease and dementia and their caregivers and support systems. My name is Dr. Nicole Cook, and I'm an associate professor in clinical immunology and public health at NSU. And it is my pleasure today to have the opportunity to interview Dr. Raymond Owenby, the chair of psychiatry at NSU, on his work around brain health. Hello, Dr. Owenby. Nice to see you, Dr. Cook. So you do work around brain health. Can you tell us a little bit about what that means? Sure, sure. Brain health is the idea that we should actually be taking care of how well our brains function over a period of time. Just like we talk about doing things that are heart healthy, we should be looking at things that are brain healthy. Uh, And that's important because we believe that keeping your brain healthy may be one of the most important things you can do to avoid cognitive decline as you get older and may actually make it possible to prevent uh, cases of dementia, of which the most common form, of course, is Alzheimer's disease. How does someone keep their brain healthy? There's a number of things that have been associated with better cognitive functioning over the the lifespan. Uh, Diet, exercise, even computer-based cognitive training have been listed as evidence-based interventions, lifestyle interventions that can help people uh, stay sharp and uh, avoid cognitive decline. That's super interesting, Dr. Owen B. Can you tell us a little bit about why this topic, this specific topic, is important to you? Well, I've been interested in in geriatrics and gerontology my entire professional career, and it's become very clear to me over the last 20 years of my work that this is an incredibly important uh, approach to helping older adults age in ways that are successful. That is, they are able to both be physically healthy as well as cognitively healthy. Yeah, I think the most important thing from my point of view that I'd like to communicate is that it, while it's important to start early, it's never too late to try to improve your brain health. The simple and some very simple things can make a big difference to some people, even a regular exercise program, watching your diet. And as I said, cognitive training, uh, some people uh, find meditation a very important and very useful form of both cognitive training and stress management. Uh, Many, many research studies, for example, have shown that there's an inverse relation between how well people's memory function and their stress level. So there's many things that we can do, mostly in the area of lifestyle. Unfortunately, I think people have a very fatalistic view of uh, cognitive decline. Studies have shown, surveys have shown that while many, uh, more than half of older adults believe that cognitive decline is associated with lifestyle factors, fewer than half think there's anything they can do about it. So I'd like people to know that there is something that they can do. So if I'm, if I'm hearing what you're saying, that if we could possibly do some work around stress management, around exercise, that we could possibly avoid some of the cognitive decline that some people may experience or expect as they get older? Yes, that's absolutely true. And it's not just me. Uh, In 2017, a blue ribbon panel of the National Academy of Sciences uh, recommended three things uh, that they felt would be potentially very helpful in avoiding cognitive decline. And those three things were making sure your uh, blood pressure is under control, uh, exercising regularly, and doing computer-based cognitive training. And then just last fall, in a group uh, in the UK published an article arguing that as many as 40% of all cases of dementia could be prevented so it's it's not a uh, too radical a notion, although I think it is a little bit harder to start exercising than it is to take a pill. And that's why many people would prefer that we had a medication. Wow, 40% of cases could be uh, avoided. That's, that's pretty incredible. 
Sure. It's, it isn't just playing brain games. There are certainly lots of sites on the web where people can uh, do things that are mentally stimulating. And in fact, some studies have suggested almost any mentally stimulating activity can help reduce the chances of developing dementia. And when I say mentally stimulating activities, those include things like doing crossword puzzles, reading regularly, playing cards, going to the movies. Uh, it's just important, certainly, to continue to be uh, cognitively active. But one of the uh, origins of this recommendation around co computer-based cognitive training comes from a large study that was sponsored by the National Institute on Aging. It was called the ACTIVE trial. It included an arm of people who were given a special form of uh, computer-based training that required them to develop uh, improved attention and faster reaction times. We call it sometimes psychomotor speed. Uh, those people have been followed for many years now. And uh, what we've seen in these long-term follow-ups is that the people who did cognitive training actually have a reduced chance of developing dementia 15, 20 years later. But it's a very specific kind of cognitive training. Uh, but certainly, it, doing something that keeps you mentally active is better than doing nothing. Ah, that's super interesting. What should health professionals be doing? I think health professionals should be aware that uh, it's important to help their patients develop brain health training programs. Because uh, generally, I think what we in behavioral medicine know is if you just tell people to, you know, this is good, do something. <laughs> Often patients really struggle with changing behavior. And in addition, they may not uh, always understand exactly what they should do. So that providing some support for goal setting, for example, uh, not just say you should get in shape, but maybe walk three times a week for 30 minutes or eat better, very general goal, but maybe help them find out about something like the Mediterranean diet or the DASH diet so they could make informed choices about what they're eating. And then again, as I've emphasized, the cognitive training does seem to be uh, an active ingredient in the brain healthy lifestyle. Yeah, so it, I can't help but wonder if perhaps some of what comes out of the past year of the pandemic and COVID and, you know, helping so many seniors be able to access iPads and, and, and Zoom and FaceTime, if possibly that might kind of have some influence on promoting brain health. Any thoughts on that, Dr. Allenby? Uh, I would hope so. I think that uh, the just the use of computers in one study that was done at uh, uh, Mayo Clinic up in Minnesota showed that particularly people who used computers were less likely to develop mild cognitive impairment, which is a form of early cognitive decline that many people believe is a preliminary to Alzheimer's disease. So I would certainly be very hopeful. And in fact, right now I'm doing a study completely online with folks uh, of brain health, trying to help uh, people learn the best ways for them to uh, develop a brain healthy lifestyle. And we're doing it all, as I said, online. Some people have tablet computers, some herbs have tablets like an iPad. Some people are using uh, their phones, but all of them seem to be able to follow the directions and do things uh, successfully. So you said before that um, computer-based um, uh, cognitive training has all of these benefits, but even if someone isn't using a computer, something like a crossword puzzle may also kind of stimulate brain function. Is there something different about computer-based cognitive training that is somehow enhanced or stimulates other parts of the brain than things like a crossword puzzle or Sudoku? Well, that's a great question. Uh, I, I don't have a, completely, a complete answer for it. I think that the possibilities are that when people do work with computer, they're learning a very complex task. Uh, crossword puzzle working, for example, is not a complicated task. So there may be an extra degree of cognitive challenge in working with computers. People often find them very engrossing. And if you're engrossed, if you're really concentrating, you tend to learn more or certainly uh, have other parts of your brain engaged. Uh, so I think there's several reasons why that might be true. 
Uh, and certainly people who use computers frequently often have access to information that others might not, whether it's health information, the ability to do banking, handle their finances, do shopping online, and that may expand their life uh, circumstances. Uh, I have data from a study we did uh, several years ago now that showed even after taking into account people's age, income, education, gender, um, that the people who used computers more frequently reported a greater or excuse me, a better quality of life. So I'm, a, I'm, I'm an epidemiologist, as you know. So if I'm thinking about this, an occupational study might be really interesting to be able to understand if people who occupations were, let's say, more manual labor versus office work, that there may be a difference there in cognitive decline over time. Yes, people have looked at that. Uh, intellectually challenging occupations is the phrase that people have often used. Uh, and it does appear that at least while people are still working, uh, people with more uh, cognitively complex daily activities are less likely to develop cognitive decline. At least in one study I saw, however, that um, differential effect uh, no longer existed uh, not long after people retired. So it's clear, uh, at least to me, how I would interpret that is that uh, just because you did it through uh you know, many years of your life, say you were an accountant, a lawyer, a physician, who knows what, uh, an epidemiologist, um, that you had cognitively challenging and intellectually stimulating activities. It's still important to stick with some kind of cognitive or brain maintenance activity after you're uh, no longer uh, full, full-time full employed. Very interesting, because it sounds like that maybe one of the things we should be prescribing to people as they retire are opportunities to keep them engaged and their mind active. Absolutely. Uh, there was a healthy aging conference uh, I attended uh, about 10 years ago now, and they had a seminar, the, the title of which has always stuck with me. The seminar uh, was Full-Time Retirement is Hazardous to Your Health. It's a lot of sense based on what you've shared with us today. What do you think the future looks like around brain health? Well, I think there's a, an enormous amount of interest in this area for the reasons I've already outlined, you know, and the fact that there are uh, no really effective treatments, disease modifying treatment for cognitive decline or Alzheimer's disease. So there's a lot of studies going on uh, and the various ways to combine uh, the various lifestyle activities. Uh, and there are a number of studies going on, including, as I mentioned, one I'm doing right now, looking at the best ways to help people change their behavior to adopt a brain healthy lifestyle. Uh, as I said, when when uh, many healthcare providers uh, provide information, it isn't always at a level people can understand. And sometimes even when you know, I think a lot of people have this experience, even when you know you should be doing something, uh, sometimes it's pretty hard to do it. <laughs> Things like uh, exercise. And so uh, giving people the support using effective behavioral management tools, evidence-based behavioral management tools to help people change their behavior. I think that's the future. So here's a fun question. If you had one magic wish to make around brain health in terms of either research, clinical care, or education, what would you wish? I wish we would have more effective and less uh, onerous ways of helping people change behavior, because I think that's really the thing that stands between uh, us and success in this area. It, it, it is um, very hard for people to change. Uh, it's hard for people to stick with things. Um, if we can't help people find a way to enjoy those healthy activities, they're never going to stick with them. I tell patients, if you can't find a way to enjoy this, there's no way you're going to do it every day for the rest of your life. Uh, but and, and we look at long term studies of people that are regular exercisers or like eating uh, the Mediterranean diet, things like that. They find ways to integrate that into their lifestyle in a way that it isn't hard for them to do it. And those are the things uh, I wish we knew more about. That's a very active area of research in behavioral medicine, but I think we're, we're, we're not where we need to be to make a, the impact I certainly would hope we could. All right, that really is the golden nugget. Said the same mm -hmm. thing in every chronic disease, really. What, what is it that can you know, help to create that behavioral change? Sure. 
Yeah. Hey, Dr. Ombi, thank you so much. Where can the audience find more resources on this topic? Uh, there's an enormous amount of information uh, online. Uh, for my study, I put up a website, if you don't mind me plugging it. It's just sfbrainhealth.com. It just has some very rudimentary research, uh, resources. That's SF, like South Florida, brainhealth, all one word, dot com. There, you're welcome to visit it there. Uh, probably the single best resource, I think, is the AARP website. It has an entire section called Staying Sharp. Uh, not just about lifestyle factors, but a number of activities, suggested activities. They give people weekly and monthly challenges. It's really a, a very good resource. Uh, certainly, the website of the National Institute on Aging has great information on cognitive decline, uh, cognitive maintenance, the importance of diet and exercise, as does the website of the Centers for Disease Control. Uh, that is fascinating. Thank you so much, Dr. Ombi, for joining us today. And to those out there, please stay tuned for upcoming topics from our renowned subject matter expert. As a reminder, this podcast is supported by the Health Resources and Services Administration, HRSA, of the United States Department of Health and Human Services as part of an award with 25% finance with non-governmental sources. The contents are those of the guest speaker and do not necessarily represent the official views of, nor an endorsement by, HRSA, HHS, or the U.S. government. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks very much, Dr. Cook.